Okay, welcome to today's webinar. Um, if you have a, a question during the talk, um, please use the uh, Q&A box and we will um, answer those questions at the end of the talk. Okay, so um, today's webinar is part of the uh, Fall Technical Conference webinar series. Um, and the Fall Technical Conference is an annual conference uh, sponsored by the American Society for Quality, the Chemical and Process Industries Division, and the Statistics Division, um, as well as the American Statistical Association section on Physical and Engineering Sciences and section on Quality and Productivity. Um, the goal of the conference is to engage researchers and practitioners um, in a dialogue that will lead to more effective use of statistics to improve quality and to foster innovation. So we've um, postponed the, the event in Park City, Utah for a couple of years, um, but we will be back in 2022. Um, so go ahead and mark that on your calendar to save the date. And currently the uh, call for papers is open. So if you're interested in presenting at the FCC, please um, submit an abstract. Um, one benefit is that um, one speaker for each talk will receive a 50% discount on the conference registration. And we have one more talk on next Friday as part of the webinar series. If you've missed um, one of the previous webinars, you can go to the Fall Technical Conference website um, and, and view them. So they're recorded and posted on the website. Um, so today's uh, session is for the SPES Award, um, which is awarded annually for the innovative use of statistics to solve a high impact problem in the physical and engineering sciences. Um, in odd numbered years, the award is um, given to a, a published paper. And in even numbered years, it is given to a collaborative um, team um, of statisticians and practitioners. Um, and we would like to thank um, the uh, committee chairman, Min Ming Lee. Okay, so. Um, this year's SPES award goes to a paper, the optimal EMG placement for a robotic prosthesis controller with sequential adaptive functional estimation. And the paper, or the award, um, goes to Jonathan Stolich, Nazmul Islam, Anna Marie Staku, Dustin Crouch, Lizzie Pan, and Helen Huang. Uh, so congratulations to the winner of the SPES award. Um, so today's talk will be by uh, Dr. John Stalrich, um, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at North Carolina State University. He earned his PhD in statistics from Virginia Tech in 2014 under John P. Morgan. He has over 30 peer-reviewed publications with contributions in the design and analysis of experimental data, spatial sampling, Bayesian optimization, penalized estimation, and functional data analysis. His research is fueled by a diverse collaboration network, including researchers from biomedical engineering, material science, computer science, ecology, toxicology, and the Korean language. Um, visit johnsawrich.com to learn more about his current and uh, future research. Um, and so with that, I will um, hand it over to you, John. Thank you very much. So first I'd like to thank the SPES Award Committee for um, choosing this project. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, I've given this talk a couple of times so some of you may have seen this before, but I always enjoy giving it. Uh, I'd also like to thank the FTC Program Committee for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. I'm among a lot of people that, um, researchers that I respect, so it's an honor to be among them. Uh, so Jen already gave the title of my talk, and you know this this award is very collaborative in nature. Here's a snapshot of the the paper in Annals of Applied Statistics. In case you're interested in reading it, uh, if you need access to it, feel free to reach out to me, and I'll, I'll get you a copy. 
Uh, but yeah, this award is very collaborative in nature. So I wanted to spend a lot of time at the beginning of this talk sort of describing the um, collaborative discussions and process that led to um, the contribution. So uh, uh, the NC State Biomedical Engineers involved in this project, which were um, uh, Dustin Crouch, Li Jipan, and Helen Huang, uh, they came to me really my first year that I was at NC State, and they based, um, asked me, you know, we're writing this proposal for NSF for developing these EMG-driven robotic hand prosthetics for transradial amputees. And I had quite a bit of collaborative experience, so I said, uh, that sounds great. What does all this mean? What does it mean to be EMG-driven? What does it mean to be a transradial amputee, and how does this even work? So I wanted to start with that because this is really what is supposed to be driving the statistical methodology. So when any of us want to move our hand, our fingers or our wrist or anything like that, it starts with um, you know, us really with this internal representation of what it is that we're trying to do in our brain. And that then sends an electrical signal down our spine to our uh, muscles in our forearm. And so what these electrical signals do is they contract the muscles in our forearm. And then what happens next depends on whether you're an able-bodied subject or whether you're an amputee. If you're an able-bodied subject, what happens is those muscles uh, are connected to bones in your hand through tendons. So when I contract my muscles, I'm pulling the tendons and it's making my hand move. I've done this many, many times just to kind of get a handle of, of what's going on here. And so the obvious problem is if you're a transradial amputee, meaning you're amputated um, in your forearm, that you don't have those tendon connections anymore. And so the idea is that we can use these EMG signals to measure muscle contractions and get an idea of what the uh, movement the amputee is intending to perform. But we need some sort of prosthesis controller visualized by this little computer here that will help translate those signals into the intended movement and then sent to this robotic limb. So these robotic limbs that are coming out now are very advanced. They're capable of performing complicated movements. The problem is developing this controller that reliably translates the intended movement to the movement that the limb can actually do. So there's been a lot of work on this project for, for many, many years. And the general trend consistent with sort of what data science does is um, well, let's just slap on a bunch of EMG sensors, get all this data, and then use some sort of signal processing method to do the prediction. Uh, the problem is that uh, while you know, this can be fairly robust and doesn't require much um, thought as to what or how to implement it, uh, really with able-bodied subjects, when we're trying to do certain types of movements like move our fingers or move our wrist, you don't need all that information. You only need a few forearm muscles to generate that, that movement. And again, all of this starts with some internal biomechanical representation that we all have in our heads on how to do the movement that we want. And the basic idea for this project was that, well, amputees, depending on when you're amputated, but we're talking about amputees that were at once that were once able-bodied, they still have this internal representation. The problem is that it's altered once they um, once their limb has been amputated, and every amputee is going to be different. However, my collaborators said, we still believe that of the residual muscles that are left over, uh, we think that these amputees still only need a few muscles to be able to reliably predict movement. And we think that honing in on those few signals will actually lead to better predictions because there's less noise from the extra sensors that we might be using if we did the traditional approach. But the question is, where do I put those sensors? That's a hard problem. And that can be very subject dependent. And so that's really the goal is to determine the optimal place to put these sensors um, to reliably predict intended movement. And so they had some data that they showed me. Uh, this project uh, mainly focused on implementing these methods for an able-bodied subject because it's still in sort of the proof of concept phase. So um, this one subject, able-bodied subject, had uh, really 15 EMG sensors placed on their forearm. I know it says 16, but one of them was, was externally generated and, and randomly generated. Um, and the, the key thing about working with an able-bodied subject is that we know the ground truth. And that's what's indicated by this picture here. So these uh, gray triangles, these are false signals. They're not really gonna be generating the types of hand movement that we're interested in. And we'll be looking at two types of movement, uh, finger flexion and extension, 
uh, and then wrist flexion and wrist extension. So those two degrees of freedom of movement. So uh, my collaborator said, well, really, it's just this muscle located here that contributes to finger flexion. Uh, but when it comes to finger extension, seven and five both sort of can explain that extension, and we really only need one of them. But what's in interesting about seven is that it can also explain wrist extension, so it can kind of serve dual purposes. And so this is just one way of representing what I was saying. We really don't need sensors at all these different places on the arm. We really need to, we can be more selective about it. Another thing that we can use with the ground truth is let's say I focus on finger movement and look at just these two EMG uh, sensor data, seven and 12. This isn't exactly how the sensor data looks, but this is what it looks like after some pre-processing and, and how, we can, how we can use it. So the, the axis on the left here shows finger position. And all you really need to know is that as the number gets higher, the more my fist is closed. As the number gets lower, the more extended my hand is. Uh, the red signal is uh, EMG7, and the uh, green signal is EMG12. And this picture sort of shows you that there's a lot of explanatory power in these two signals for explaining movement. So for example, when there's no movement going on here, both of these signals aren't really doing anything. As this signal starts to move down, meaning my finger is extended, we see that almost concurrently that seven is also increasing. So we see this um, relationship happening. Uh, but then we see that here the, the movement stops. And yet my signal is still you know, somewhat active, although it looks like it's, it's decreasing. Well, this is because I can only extend my hand so much. I can't go past a certain point. So there's some physical constraints here. Um, and we can also see something similar with EMG12. As, as it kind of gets activated, we see that the, the hand starts to be uh, flexed, it closes. Now there's some interesting things about this picture that I didn't really appreciate at first, but I'll point out now. Again, like what I was saying, here is a place in which there's no movement and yet my EMG signal is activated. Well, that's because if I wanna keep my hand open, I need to keep activating my muscles. Another thing I wanna point out is this event B that I'm locating here, and this is what caused a lot of trouble. What you'll notice is that unlike here, where the lack of EMG signals led to no movement. This event here also has a lack of EMG information, and yet there is movement going on. The reason is because for this able-bodied subject, there are these things called active and passive forces. So if you want to follow along with me, if you fully open up your hand and relax your muscles, your hand returns back to a resting state. And so in that case, you don't have any active EMG signals, and yet there's movement going on due to passive forces. So this idea of we're going to be using high density EMG data and doing a selection on which ones are most important, it sounds like a basic variable selection problem. But as um, I've learned, especially from you know, screening experiments, how well your selection works depends on how well your model is. And so if the model that we choose to perform screening on is poor, our selection is going to be poor. So I started out with a basic model to see what might happen. I modeled finger position using concurrent EMG signals. Now I'm knowing, I know now anyway, that's gonna cause a problem in this place here, this event here where I have a lot of movement and no EMG signals. So that's a, a point in which the model will be, will be poor. And using just a basic scatter plot, you can see eh, a linear model might not be such a good idea. There's definitely something complex going on. Nonetheless, let's look at how, how well our model predicts um, the true position. True position is in black, predicted is in red. Uh, we can see that the red line sort of follows the trends fairly well, um, but there's definitely some places in which we are doing poor consistently. And uh, this to me was exciting because it said, okay, well, this is doing consistently bad here. This consistency means I need to look at this more and discover what I might be able to do with my model to, to address that. The first thing that I looked at was a lagged linear model, meaning, let me go back to here. You'll notice that there isn't necessarily an instantaneous reaction of movement to activation of an EMG signal. You'll see here that EM, uh, X7 is being activated here, but there's no movement 
um, concurrently. It's more of a lag movement. So if I were to take this red line and shift it forward a little bit, I could maybe get more of a concurrent relationship and maybe get better modeling. So that was the next thing that we looked at. And it does fit the data a little bit better, particularly in cases where EMG7 is actually activated. And so this is actually backed up by a lot of the biomechanical research on how um, movement reacts to um, the electrical signals that are generated from the contractions. But it's still not perfect. We still see places in which it's not doing well. And as I discovered later, it's because of those passive movements that I pointed out to you earlier. Uh, the other thing that we're ignoring with these models is you can see that there are some wild cases in which our prediction goes way off of what the true, true uh, prediction is. And that's because we're not taking into account the physical constraints that I can only extend or flex my hand so far. And so uh, instead of using a linear model, I used a general additive model. And this one looks like it fits much, much better and, and fairly well. But again, there's some places where the model is failing. And if I were to try to do selection under this model, I anticipate that I'm going to get some poor selection properties. So this data exploration, which you know, I kind of demonstrated it as me looking at a bunch of plots, but this was really months of back and forth between me and these collaborators of like, what, is, what do you think is going on here that's causing this to happen? Um, that really led to a lot of these insights. And so here are the three things that we've learned, sort of characteristics of the data is that there is a lag in EMG activation and the resulting um, contraction and, and hence leading to movement. Uh, we need a threshold for each EMG for which movement can't occur anymore, right? I can have an activated EMG, but it, at some point movement can't occur anymore due to physical constraints. And us as able-bodied subjects anticipate that. I don't ever anticipate my fingers to bend backwards and hit my wrist again. I'm anticipating those sort of physical constraints. And then the last one, which we need to address, is that movement can occur due to both activation and relaxation of our muscles. And um, from what I've seen in the literature, a lot of the existing methods um, before us didn't really take into account this relaxation um, component of the model. And so the gamma and lag approach took care of one and two, but we need to address also three. And that's what's going to lead to a new model. Um, so we decided to model our EMG effects um, on velocity and let them be dependent on position. And so the idea is that this robotic limb would know what the recent position was of the prosthetic and could use that to um, model the, the effect. So here's where we're going to get a little bit more math. You know, I need to introduce a framework based off of the knowledge that I just generated. That's what we should be doing as statisticians. Uh, so the covariates uh, we're going to use is no longer just a single EMG point, but rather I'm going to be using a recent past of the EMG information. And this is what takes us to a simple linear model to a functional linear model. So I'm going to think of my covariates as now functions of the recent past. So the ith observation of the kth EMG signal, I now observe that in a continuous range indexed by s. And so zero would mean concurrent, and negative delta means how far I've gone into the past. And we can actually choose delta based off of some of the biomechanical literature. We picked it to be roughly a third of a second. And so here's one representation, or here's the representation of the model that I just described. If I let yi be the velocity, uh, and again, letting these x's denote my uh, k EMG signals, which for the application is 16. And zi would be the recent position of the robotic limb or the hand. This is our functional linear model. So I'm taking a sum of a bunch of integrals. And this piece here is our position dependent effect, gamma sub k, which depends on both s and the position there. So in a way, it looks a lot like a linear model, although the individual components are, are somewhat complicated. Now, when I went into this, I had nothing or no idea about using functional data analysis. I just arrived at it by necessity of what I determined from the application. Fortunately, I got a, a lot of great collaborators in the department, such as Ana Maria Staiku, um, to help me out with this. So I've got my model. Let's now talk about the variable selection process. So a lot of variable selection methods that you may be familiar with has some sort of linear model and it's saying 
I'm going to test whether this coefficient beta k is zero. How does that extend to this scenario? Well, now I need to do the same thing, but for these super complicated functions, these gamma k functions. So how in the world can I estimate these things? And the idea is to do that using a tensor product representation, which is a fairly common tactic. So you use basis functions uh, in the S dimension and the Z dimension. And then that leads to an approximation and then leads to a group of coefficients. So these omega L's and these tau M's, these are things that I'm, things that I, basis functions that I'm specifying beforehand. So I know what these things are. I know what the S is and I know what the ZI is. So the only thing I don't know is the betas. So what we need is an estimation method that uh, can do selection. So it should encourage sparsity among these estimates. So I want some of these gamma K hats to be shrunk to zero. Another thing that I want is I want these uh, uh, estimates of my gamma Ks to be smooth. I don't want them to be wiggly and kind of go all over the place. I want them to be interpretable. And one way to do that is to enforce or regularize the, the smoothness of these coefficients. So not only do I want to enforce sparsity, but I want to enforce smoothness in the two directions of S and D. And we do that by penalizing the second derivative. Uh, so I'm not the first one to look at a functional variable selection model. Um, not many have done this in doing two dimensions. I haven't found one. Um, but there was also some unique things about my problem that um, demanded that we need to modify some of these existing methods. So let's go back to how am I going to do these things? How am I going to have an estimation method that does both of these things? And the key point uh, is that I'm trying to penalize multiple aspects of these functions. And so I need a penalty that takes all of those things into account. And so we're going to be using basically a group lasso type penalty where it's comprised of these three different components. The first component is a measure of the magnitude of my uh, estimate. And so that would be saying or, or controlling the shrinkage, how much it shrinks towards zero. These other two components are controlling the smoothness of these two measures. And remember, this is uh, measuring the second derivative. And one way to make the second derivative um, approach zero is the curve doesn't have to be flat. It just has to be linear. And so to encourage smoothness, I have these extra tuning parameters, phi s and phi z. Uh, and so again, the larger I make phi s, for example, the more I want to encourage uh, our our estimates to be nearly linear in the S direction, which would be very easy to make interpretations. Uh, I'm not going to go into it um, here, but the tensor product representation allows us to write this penalty here really as a function, not of gamma K, but as a function of the betas. And that's one uh, benefit of using the tensor product representation. So we're really going to be performing group lasso with respect to the groups of these beta coefficients. And that's going to allow us then to do the same thing with respect to the gamma k's. We have to make that sort of connection. And so that's the approach is we're gonna have and use this penalty, which is really extending the penalty that's in the Girth Ice 2013 paper to two dimensions. Um, by minimizing the sum of squared error plus this penalty here, where now I have another penalty lambda that is intended to control the sparsity of, um, of our estimates, although I'll come back to that a little bit later. But we have three sets of tuning parameters, and so that does present a difficult tuning parameter selection problem. Uh, we did this with a five-fold cross-validation plus one standard error rule. I don't have time to get into it today, but you may ask, how do you enforce a one standard error rule in multiple dimensions? Uh, if you wanted me to address that, I do talk about it later uh, in the appendix, but I won't go into it now. It's just another aspect of the problem. So I have a, an approach at this point, and so we applied it. And the nice thing, again, about applying this to the able-bodied data is I know the ground truth. I know what I want to see happen. So what did happen? Well, we found that uh, many of the correct EMG signals were detected and were picked up but we ended up having a lot of false positives and we would like to cut those down as much as we can. 
And so after many months, I broke it down into these two issues. The first issue, as I'll show in just a minute, uh, there's actually a latent variable structure to these EMG signals. If you, I mean, one easy way to think of that is if I have two sensors that are right next to each other, they're going to be picking up pretty much the same information. And that is happening in a way for this data application. And by the way we've set up our penalty, the group lasso estimates we get tend to split up the effects across multiple sensors. And that's what's causing a lot of these false positives to happening and preventing a sparse signal from being detected. Issue two was the way I was doing cross-validation. I was doing this the way most of us do cross-validation. I was randomly splitting up the folds uh, or creating the folds by randomly splitting up the data. The problem with the way that we collected our data is that there's a time series component to it. And what ended up happening is that I found that the training and test sets, a lot of the folds were very similar to each other. And so that's another reason that was leading to uh, overfitting and over selection. And so we implemented block cross validation where I wasn't splitting them up randomly. I was splitting up the, the data into different blocks of, of time. And that seemed to solve that issue. Uh, so here's another demonstration of that latent variable structure that we're going to hone in on that really motivates this safe approach that I'm, I'm going to be uh, talking about. So before I showed just seven and 12, here I'm going to be showing all of the signals for this movement data set that I showed earlier. And you can see. In this stage here, there's a lot of signals that are kind of doing the same thing, although maybe not quite at the same magnitude as seven or, or five. And the point is that whatever movement would occur in this region might be uh, well explained by any one of these signals. Something similar is true for uh, this section of uh, data here. Uh, what I have on the right here is a concurrent correlation plot between all of these, um, these signals. And, we can see that there's really kind of these two groups where there's a lot of there's a high degree of similarity between these signals, and so uh, lasso is is known and group lasso is well known to to somewhat struggle with cases where you have a latent variable signal. Uh, you also see these two other signals nine and six. Nine was the um, externally generated uh, variable that my uh, collaborators added to kind of see what I determined. For some reason, it ends up being slightly correlated with X3, although I'm not sure why. And X6 was a, a measurement taken on the bicep, which we know, uh, which they knew did not affect it. So that's why those are kind of up there. So the way we address this is through a sequential adaptive estimation process, um, recognizing that what the group lasso was doing is it was taking whatever the true effect was and splitting it across different effects. I wanted an iterative procedure where that it would recognize it and try to hone in on just one of those in that group. And it's based off of combining really two really important concepts, uh, adaptive lasso and relaxed lasso. And so adaptive lasso recommends that we don't apply the same tuning parameters to every variable. Instead, what we do is we add adaptive weights to each one of them uh, using if we have any uh, prior information. And so if I have some prior uh, guess or idea of what the estimate or what the effects are, I would use those as weights in what I'm doing. So I'll just point out, for example, that um, again, lower weights mean less penalty. If I were to say that one of these effects I thought was very, very strong, its corresponding weight would then be very, very small. And so the adaptive procedure would allow that estimate to grow bigger um, and is more likely to recover the, the true effect. The other one is relaxed lasso, um, which essentially recommends that uh, for every subset of variables, you then do lasso you continue to do the lasso path, but just on that subset of variables. So you're never allowing any extra variables to uh, become included. And so it's basically creating a path between the subset lasso estimate and then the subset OLS estimate, although it doesn't quite extend here, but that's what it did in that paper. So we combined this into this procedure that we call sequential adaptive uh, functional estimation, although the functional part of this isn't necessary. This can work for really any penalized method. So the stage one method is we generate those gamma tildes, those initial estimates, by using group lasso with all weights fixed to one, so a non-adaptive step. And we did the one standard error cross-validation to decide on the tuning parameters. 
So based off of that tuning parameter that we've chosen, we'll have some covariates that are important and not important. The ones that are not important, we just toss out and we focus our attention now on the, the subset that are important. For the subset that are important, we use their estimates to generate the adaptive weights, that FK, GK, and HK. And then we do adaptive group lasso with those weights on the reduced covariate set. So that's what's emulating relaxed lasso. And then you essentially just repeat steps two to four, uh, you know, maybe for a, a fixed number of stages, or maybe you look at some sort of convergence criterion for that. Uh, we just fixed the number of stages and didn't bother discussing a convergence criterion. And so we tested this on all the data that we have. Uh, there's actually six total data sets um, when we look at finger movement, and it breaks down into two different pieces. There's consistent finger movement, which is where we asked the subject to just sort of open and close their hand um, at a fairly consistent pattern. And then three random data sets where we asked them, you know, just do whatever you want with your fingers for 30 seconds. So we compared our approach, our safe approach, to three existing methods on variable selection and simpler models that um, uh, still took into account position effects, but didn't do uh, position dependent effects. So sort of an overall sort of position main effect in, in the model. And we'll denote these competitors as AGL for just adaptive group lasso. This is from the Gertheis paper. Uh, FAR for functional additive regression from this um, annals paper, and least absolute deviation, which is the same thing as adaptive group lasso, but it replaces the loss function of sum of squares error with the um, some of the absolute uh, differences. So it's a, just a different loss function, and that should be less prone to going after outliers. So here are the results for the first stage. Again, no adaptive weighting is going on here. And what I'm showing you in these uh, in this table uh, are the number of true positives compared to false positives. And so what's kind of weird about this for the finger movement data is really there's, there's two things I want to get. I want to make sure I get EMG12 because I, I'm, my collaborators told me that that's the main one that explains um, extension or, or flexion. They also told me that either five or seven would be good for uh, doing finger um, extension. So I'm saying that if it's a true positive of two or three, where three would be I picked five, seven, and 12, um, those would be successes. So having twos or threes on the left would, are all good scenarios. Uh, and then false positives would be if I picked any other one of those except for those three signals. And in almost all the scenarios, we see that there's um, what I had said earlier. We pick up the true positives, but there's a lot of false positives as well. Uh, you know, it sort of depends on the consistent versus the random data set, uh, and it depends on the method. So uh, functional additive regression actually looks like it does fairly well, um, at least in terms of false positives. Uh, but uh, the other two methods, AGL and, and LAD, those were much more prone to, to overselection. Our method, safe Z, where the Z here denotes position dependent effects, uh, looks like maybe it does slightly worse in terms of false positives, but it's more selective um, in the true positive case. Maybe not so much in random data sets, though, at least in the first stage. So we iterated this for five stages. And here are the results after five stages. Whenever I've highlighted something in red, it means it changed. So FAR did not change at all. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with how that penalty is constructed. I won't bother getting into that. But we do see that the other three methods do respond to this adaptive weighting. And for the most part, it, it, it helps all these methods. Um, so it, it helped the false positive or the true positives go down from three to two. So really what that means is at stage one, it would say, well, we need both five and seven. And then eventually it would just say, well, I really only need one of those, which is consistent with my claim that this procedure will um, help differentiate when we kind of split a signal across different effects. And we also see that the number of false positives decrease 
uh, as we go on to these stages. And in the best scenario, which is ours, the safe method uh, was perfect. It had no false positives and it tended to pick very few true positives. It's only in this case that it kept all three of them. And so we were very excited with this, this ability to uh, cipher through this and, and, and get to a sparse model, which would, would help with implementation of these robotics. Uh, there's also the question, not only of selection, but how well these things predict. And so what we did to assess that is I fit the model on one of the six data sets and then used it to predict the other five data sets. So for example, when I say FC1 here, um, that means that I fit the model using FC1 and then I looked at the prediction for the other ones. And as we can see, SAFE, which is in black for finger movement, uh, did much better than the other models. Maybe not much better. In some cases, it's uh, you know only slightly better, but for a lot of cases, it, it does significantly better. Um, and the thing to point out is it's able to do that with even fewer EMG signals. And so it's kind of the best of both worlds situation. Uh, it was even better for the wrist movement data set. I don't talk much about that due to um, the time, but you can see that there's a, a clear difference in its performance and, and wrist movement, and it had very uh, similar uh, selection performance as well over the other methods. So again, another reason to be excited. Uh, but the one thing that was ch that's challenging with these models in, is interpretation, dealing with these bivariate effects that are really functions. And so another thing that's sort of lacking of the state of the art methods before we publish this is that um, they don't really give you interpretations on how each EMG signal is affecting the, the response. But in this case, we can interpret this, although it takes a little bit of work. So to demonstrate this interpretation, let's look at uh, the coefficient estimates that we get for the third consistent finger movement data set. Remember, seven leads to flexion, 12, oh no, seven leads to extension, 12 leads to flexion. So here's a visualization of that estimated gamma seven in this case. So again, it's a bivariate function. On the bottom here, we have the uh, S dimension, which is past time. When S is zero, that's what's happening concurrently. And as we go backwards in time, that is what's happening in the past. And on the y-axis, we have whatever the, con uh, the concurrent finger position was or what the recent past position was. So right off the bat, what we could see is that well, when finger position is high, which is when our fingers are extended, the magnitude of this effect is approaching zero. It's not too far off from zero. We see a lot of gray up here. So as far as what seven does to our response, it really doesn't do a whole lot to our velocity, our response, if the recent finger position was flexion, which is exactly what makes sense. It shouldn't contribute to what's going on when we have flexion. Most of it is happening when finger is either at a neutral position or when it's already extended. And we kind of can see this opposite behavior uh, depending on the time. So this being blue on this part right here, blue being negative, this says that if my X7 signal is concurrently being activated, then that's going to lead to a negative effect, which is consistent, right? Negative of velocity would mean I'm actively extending my, my fingers. But the opposite effect happens in the past, which says that if my uh, signal was activated in the recent past also, it has the opposite effect. It leads to your finger um, fingers becoming more flexed. So if you think about inserting into this point here, and I'll do a demonstration of this in just a minute, if I were to think about what might happen in this finger position range. Like for example, maybe my, I'm maintaining a constant EMG signal. If I integrated that part here, these two effects would cancel each other out, meaning 
no velocity. Well, that's exactly what's happening if I keep my hand flat is I have a flat, consistent EMG signal and no velocity. And so this is able to account for things like this happening where you can have a cancellation effect. And it, that cancellation effect only happens though in certain positions. A similar interpretation happens for 12, although it's flipped. Now it's happening in the more positive positions versus the more negative positions. So to kind of further get this point across, um, let's look at these effects if I've actually sliced it at a given position. So Z equals 40. So just to help you see, I'm taking this picture on the right here and I'm conditioning on finger position of 40. So I've got three kind of plots here. The plot in the middle is what this looks like when I've sliced it. I do it actually for both 12 and I do it for seven. For seven, it's a fairly flat curve, although it dips down a little bit. For 12 though, it's a very active effect that's almost nearly linear. So at this position, we can see that the effect for 12 is much more involved than it is for seven. On the left here are two samples of EMG signals, one shown in black, one shown in red. So let's track this with the black signals first and then do it with the red. So the black signals here, we can see that 12 is activated in the past but concurrently, it's not doing anything. This is a signal that's consistent with me relaxing that muscle. So me having my hand flex and then relaxing it. Uh, what also happened at that same time is EMG7 was active a little bit, but uh, this is actually not too different from just sort of uh, random noise being picked up, although maybe it's activated a little bit. So the resulting effect on our response requires us to multiply that X7 curve with the gamma 7 curve and the X12 curve and the gamma 12 curve to multiply them and then integrate. And this is the picture of those two functions multiplied. What we could see is the solid black line, which is me multiplying X7 and gamma 7, is basically flat. So when I integrate that thing, I'm gonna get, in this case, a slightly negative number, but not something that's very strong. For the 12 curve, when I integrate it, it's going to be mostly a negative value, which means that this is going to lead to my hand extending more. So here I'm getting extension from EMG 12, although I said when 12 is actively being, uh, when, when EMG12 is active, it should lead to flexion. So this is how I'm able to get that opposite behavior due to relaxation. This is what's allowed, allowing me to separate movement due to activation and relaxation. And it's really what led to the success of our analysis. Going back to the red curve, again, we can jump down. We can see that the opposite is happening. Here we see seven is mostly flat, although here it looks like it may be slightly activated. Uh, and here I'm actively... Uh, concurrently activating 12. So I should now be actively extending uh, or flexing my fingers. Sorry, I keep mixing those up. And when I multiply those curves and I were to integrate, well, now I would get a positive value for 12, which would mean active flexion. And so it's really this, this the complication of this model is, is what allowed us, it was necessary to be able to model these two different types of behavior and I think contributed significantly to us being able to um, do correct variable selection. You need the right model to do correct variable selection. And again, in both cases, we can see that seven is not really contributing much at all to the movement um, at this position, which is again, what we would expect to happen. So there's still a lot of future work. This, this one reason why I get excited about projects like this is it always opens up more statistical questions and, and also has a lot of impact, especially to um, these amputees. Um, you know, we're still working on, uh, you know, we have this proof of concept for able-bodied subjects and we're, we're working on uh, eventually extending this to 
uh, amputee data. And for those of you that are still following in our wake, you might ask, wait a minute, how can we do this with amputee data? Because your model requires movement. How can I model movement of an amputee if they have no hand? Um, well, there's, there's a couple of different strategies, although that's going to be have some loss of fidelity. Um, if someone is amputated in only one arm, one thing that we can have these amputees do is um, mirrored movement, where they have one intact limb and one, one amputated limb, and we ask them to do the same movement for both of them so that we can collect movement data from the intact limb. Uh, it gets more complicated when that, that's not the case, um, and there's really some severe limitations on what this method would be able to do for that. Uh, and we're also um, working on, uh, you know, that would be for doing selection, but we're also looking at actually implementing this model itself as a way of doing a prosthesis uh, controller. Uh, and so that's a couple bit of work that requires more collaboration between me and my uh, collaborators. Uh, some of the statistical work this has spawned um, has been looked at by my two students, Rebecca North and Julia Holter. Rebecca North just recently um, graduated, got her PhD. Um, the first question comes into really looking back at the penalty that I had earlier. Uh, and I didn't emphasize this earlier, but uh, one sort of tricky thing about that penalty is that as I change my lambda parameter, which I said should be controlling sparsity, it's also going to affect smoothness, uh, which can really cause some bizarre model exploration as I change my different tuning parameters. And so she looked at other penalty functions to separate those and, and uh, justified why those penalties might be more preferred. And the other thing that she looked at, which is much more exciting to me anyway, is rather than relying on SAFE and all of its multiple procedures to or multiple stages, to separate out these effects, what if I started my analysis first by doing some sort of multivariate functional principal component analysis, that's a mouthful, on the EMG signals to kind of detect uh, sparsity at the very beginning, rather than kind of hoping and praying that this, the safe method will do it um, for me. And that's also led to a lot of success, particularly with the computations that are involved with this project. Uh, group lasso, especially for the application that I have, would be very slow. It could take hours to do these five stages. And so that was one thing that could, that cut down the computation time significantly to something like 45 minutes, um, which was very exciting. Uh, Julia is working on uh, another way of doing tuning parameter selection. Uh, that better mimics the relaxed lasso. And that's automatically led to dramatic improvements in the, the stage one results, which is it's very exciting. And she's also looking at a systematic tuning parameter exploration based off of things like experimental design to lead to more efficient um, computations of exploring the, the tuning parameter space. All right, that's all I have today. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone has questions for John, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A box. Um, and I guess I, I do have a question. So, I mean, I think this is both a very interesting topic statistically, as well as such an important um, application. Um, and I was wondering, do you have like, um, in terms of the functional data analysis, um, you know, if someone's interested in learning more about that, do you have any recommendations? Um, there's a lot of great textbooks written. I think I have one. Yeah, the one by uh, Ramsey and Silverman is a very good um, introductory textbook on functional data analysis. And um, the key thing for me was to think of functional data analysis as really an extension of multivariate data analysis. Uh, to, to approach it in that way first, but then to appreciate the nuances into how difficult it is to extend it. Like there, there are some minor nuances to it. Um, and there's just, the thing about functional data analysis is that there's just a lot of uh, different combinations that you can have. Like in this case, we had a scalar response with a functional covariate. You could have the flip of that. You could have a 
scalar covariate and what you're predicting is a functional response and you can do all these sort of combinations and uh, they do a good job of introducing a lot of those things in that um, in that textbook so i would i would recommend the one uh, again it's a functional data analysis by uh, ramsey and silverman okay do we have any other questions for john Okay, well, I uh, thank you for, for giving the talk today and uh, congratulations again on the SES Award. All right, thank you very much.